Welcome to the seventh chapter in the Conservation for Climate Change course. This chapter discusses the process of ecosystem function modeling, and the course material is prepared by Bob Scholes of the CSIR. Biodiversity can be thought of as having three aspects, composition, structure, and function, as well as three levels, the gene, the population, and the ecosystem. Almost all systematic conservation planning tools focus at the species composition level, where the red dot is in this diagram. Some deal with biome or habitat modeling, which is the red ellipse on the left. The subject of this presentation is ecosystem function modeling, which is the orange ellipse at the bottom. And this also deals to a degree with ecosystem structure. Clearly, there are gaps that current modeling processes do not cover, but when the three different approaches are combined, they do give a moderately clear picture of how it all works. An example of an ecosystem function model used in relation to climate change is the dynamic global vegetation models that link to global circulation models and provide a changing land surface to them. These models simulate the carbon uptake and loss of the surface features, the albedo, the bulk stomata of conductivity, and the roughness of the surface as it interacts with the atmosphere. Of course, since it's dealing with the GCM, which typically have very broad scales, the best that these models have is a very crude representation of several biomes or functional types. However, some of the better models, such as the LPJ model or the Sheffield DVGM, can also include such processes as fire and the interactions of mammals. Unfortunately, these DVGMs are very generalized. They have to be in order to run everywhere in the world. For example, all savannas are in one category. So they're not very useful for providing advice to local land managers. In general, the computational complexity means they're very hard to use unless you happen to have a supercomputer handy. Furthermore, unlike GCM outputs, the results are not typically made available over the internet. In general, DVGMs are optimized for northern temperate conditions, since the teams that run them are typically from these areas, and the scale is inappropriate for conservation planning. The equations that govern these models are both extremely complex and unavailable for study and consideration by the end user. Ecosystem models can often be very complicated, requiring hundreds of parameters, is it therefore possible to make a simple one just for African savannas that is nevertheless realistic in its main features? This was attempted, and it's called a reduced form model. The functional types of the system are obviously restricted to those occurring within the savanna region, but they are significantly expanded beyond the generic global types. This model includes the effects of temperature, rainfall, seasonality, carbon dioxide, soil texture, fire regimes, and mega herbivores. The equations used to integrate these are quasi-mechanistic in nature, that is, they are simple reduced forms of the mechanistic processes that work within plants, and they describe the emergent properties that are observed at an ecosystem scale. The model was run with a timescale step of a single year, hence seasonal effects were implied within the model but not actually calculated separately, and the spatial scale of the model was a patch of land. Here is what the plumbing of such a model might look like. Note that the plants and animals have both been lumped together into broad functional types, the boxes, such as browsers, mixed grazers, coarse grazers, etc. The interactions between them are shown as arrows, and the factors controlling these interactions are shown as the bow ties. Water is key to savanna ecosystem modelling, because they are water limited rather than temperature or light limited. Even when these ecosystems are nutrient limited, the nutrient availability is controlled by when the soil is moist. Here is a very simple way of modeling water balance, using only the information easily available from climate change simulations, monthly rainfall, maximum temperature and minimum temperature. It ends up as an index of the number of days in the year for which plant growth is possible, also known as G days. Basically, the water balance is the sum for each month of the average daily amount of precipitation, divided by the daily evaporation, and multiplied by the number of days in the month. This assumes that the rainfall is greater than the evaporation. If this is not the case, then the rain over evaporation term is given to be 1. The E0, or open water evaporation, is calculated using the second equation. We needn't go into the details of this term. But it is worth noting that it incorporates air temperature, that's the monthly mean, minimum, and maximum, as well as the altitude and latitude of the sill being modelled. This equation was developed by Lineker. These are the main factors known to control how much grass grows every year. 
The first of these is the rainfall, although it is not so much the quantity of rain that matters as the duration of growth opportunity. In other words, that's the length of time in which conditions are appropriate for growth. This factor is affected by evaporation as well as rain, and the effects of soil texture on the drainage of water from the soils plays an important role. The soil fertility is important, and tree cover plays a role because grass typically does not grow well under shade. Daytime temperatures must fall within an optimal range for grass growth, and, as shown in Chapter 4, the levels of carbon dioxide in the air can be a significant factor in controlling plant growth. In some fertile savanna ecosystems, moderate grazing also has a mildly stimulating effect on grass growth. Here is a database graph of yearly above-ground grass net primary productivity in the absence of trees. It clearly shows what is called the inverse texture hypothesis, first attributed to Emmanuel nov Mayer. Clay soils tend to have a higher response than sandy soils, and are much more productive at high rainfall intensities. At low rainfall intensities, the formation of a solid clay cap on the soil will limit grass growth to a much greater extent than sandy soils, and therefore sandy soils are more productive at low rainfall. The linear grass production versus rainfall relationship has two parameters, a slope and an intercept. The slope is called the rain use efficiency. It is approximately inversely linearly related to the sand content of the soil. Mechanistically, it's probably more correct to say that it is directly and linearly related to the clay plus silt content of the soil, and the relationship shown above follows from the fact that sand plus silt plus clay equals 100%. It turns out that the intercept of the grass production versus rainfall curve is approximately linearly related to the slope of the rain use efficiency. In other words, you actually only need one constant to characterize this relationship, since you can calculate the other from it. The higher the rain use efficiency, the lower the intercept value, following an approximately straight line relationship. Higher intercept values mean that more rain is required for a given amount of primary productivity in comparison to lower values. In other words, the significance of this graph is that the more efficiently water is used, the less rainfall is required, and efficiency of use is covariant with soil water holding capacity. In savannas, the presence of trees has a powerful suppressive effect on grass production due to competition. This effect is almost always non-linear. The first increments of tree biomass have a greater suppressive effect than the last ones. The degree of curvature depends on site conditions. A form for this curve can be derived from first principles regarding the way trees and grass carve up the space in savannas. Here is a simplified solution for a particular set of assumptions regarding tree canopy radius and rooting radius. In this equation, P is the fraction of grass primary productivity in relation to P0, the productivity of an untreed area, and BA is the total basal area of trees in square meters per hectare. So, Given that tree cover limits grass growth retention, we might expect to see areas becoming increasingly treed until the grass dies out. This is not the case, however, and so clearly some other factor is guiding the maximum tree basal area. Considering savanna data from all around the world, there is a clear upper limit to the amount of tree biomass or leaf area that a piece of land can support, given its water balance. This line represents the limit of tree-on-tree -tree competition. Charlie Shackleton's PhD consisted of measuring tree circumference growth of thousands of stems in savannas all over South Africa every year for six years. From this wonderful data set, some patterns emerge. The two main controllers of tree growth in savannas are the size of the tree, that's its stem diameter, and how much tree-on-tree -tree competition it experiences. The latter is indexed by the tree basal area as a fraction of the maximum basal area given that climate. The graph here shows the performance of this model. About 64% of variance in growth rate is explained. The interesting thing about this relationship is that a population of small diameter trees is therefore much more productive than one with a large diameter of trees, and this is important and will be discussed later. Rising levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have a stimulatory effect on plant growth. This effect saturates above about 1,000 parts per million and is different for C4 photosynthetic plants, such as tropical grasses, and C3 plants, such as trees. A simple phenomenological model that fits the empirical data uses a beta function. A phenomenological model is one that does not try to explain the underlying process. It just reproduces the result. 
Hence, in conditions of increasing carbon dioxide, as currently is occurring through anthropogenic causes, it is likely that the proportion of trees in the savanna ecosystem will increase. There is also a difference in the temperature response of grasses and trees. In both cases it is hump-shaped, but C4 plants have a higher temperature optimum. These curves have a big impact on the outcome, because mean summertime daytime temperatures in many savannas are close to the C3 optimum. If they get hotter, production of trees goes down, but production of grasses continues to rise initially, and then declines at a slower rate than the trees. The function that is used to model this relationship is shown under the graph. So, what are the main factors governing tree mortality? For the savanna ecosystem, the first is exceedingly well known, since savannas are one of the globe's prime examples of a fire-driven landscape. The second factor governing mortality is elephants. Elephants are capable of knocking trees over in order to get at the foliage or fruits on the top, and typically do so, particularly in marginal habitats where other lower food sources are being consumed rapidly by other herbivores. These smaller trees are then susceptible to burning. An emerging result from work by Brian van Vilgen and others is that the fraction of the landscape that burns is almost independent of fire management policy. In general, up to about 140 days of growth in a year, the amount of burning increases in response to the large amount of burnable foliage. However, after 170 growth days per year, this proportion decreases because of the large amount of rainfall and concomitant dampness of the area. In other words, climate plays a much larger role in the extent of burning than does management policies. The population dynamics of herbivores and carnivores basically follows logistic growth functions. There is a maximum intrinsic population growth rate, which scales with body size, and it is reduced linearly as the population approaches its carrying capacity, which is in turn determined by the abundance of its food. Thus, the change in mammalian population numbers is equivalent to the current population multiplied by the growth rate, less the offtake through predation or other mortality. The growth rate is calculated in the second equation. The value r max is the maximum growth rate for a population, and is a logarithmic function, as described in the third equation. The f value in the second term of the growth rate calculation is the food requirement per head per day, and the c in the same t term is the fraction of prey biomass that can be consumed within a year. When you build even a moderately complex food web model, you soon find out that it is very hard to keep all the pieces coexisting. If you have two types of herbivore eating one grass resource, one will soon outcompete the other. So there must be some sort of resource partitioning, although it is possible for each herbivore to share some of its optimal forage with other types. You can balance this by making one more preferred by a predator. Predators are likely to prefer the faster growing prey, for the simple reason that it's likely to be more available for consumption. This is included in the model by a preference term for predators, such that its preference for a species is a function of its representativity in the total population of herbivores. And finally, predators in general are much longer lived than herbivores, and are also proportionally slower growing. If the predators have a fast growth rate, they'll go into a boom and bust cycle with the prey. A simple model of the interactions between grasses and trees for the next 80 years shows us a reasonable pattern. Over a century, the tree biomass declines somewhat, and grass increases, as would be expected. This model does not take into account any of the herbivore interactions, and assumes no further change in carbon dioxide levels or temperature. In other words, this change is based on the climatic status quo. Fire, however, is included in the model. If herbivores and carnivores are added into the system, the system is still stable, but not yet equilibrated in one century. Initially, coarse grazers, which are currently the dominant animal biomass component of the savanna system, increase with the grass component of the ecosystem. However, browser numbers initially expand and then decrease slowly as the proportion of the ecosystem given over to grassland increases. The carnivore population will also likely increase, tracking the growth in browser numbers, and then follow a gradual decrease as it becomes prey limited. It must be noted that all these models assume an unmanaged landscape with little or no human interaction. Adding elephants into the system, however, throws things completely out of kilter. Since elephants are known to prefer browsing, although they can survive as grazers as well, their impact on tree population is considerable. 
the proportion of grass grows very rapidly, and both tree basal area and tree height drop to a new stable or coppiced point, as the elephants push over the larger trees and coppice the smaller ones. This stable, highly productive coppice tree population is optimal for supporting elephants, since the level of production is so much higher than fully grown trees. The elephant population climbs rapidly from an initially moderate level to a very high one, in excess of 4 tons per square kilometre. Even more importantly, the browsing pressure from elephants would push the browser population into, com in into competitive collapse before 2040, and then a shift in diet to include more greys would ca cause the coarse grazer population to crash within the next 25 years. The main reason for this is that there are no real predators for elephants, and the question that follows is why has this effect not been observed in nature? It would seem that the most probable reason is that there is no such thing as an undisturbed wild population, as we've been hypothesizing. In fact, for tens of thousands of years, the top predator in the African savanna has been the human, and our hunting ancestors are the only reason we're not currently knee-deep in elephants. Now we apply a climate experiment on top of the pattern with no climate change. The minimum experiment is a high change and low change scenario, and two different climate change models chosen from the about 12 available from the IPCC Data Distribution Center, because they behave rather differently over southern Africa. For purposes of this experiment, the upper estimate of environmental shift was provided by the Hadley A2 scenario, giving an increase in temperature of about 5 degrees Celsius, and a reduction in average rainfall of approximately 6%. The lower estimate of climate change was provided by the CC model B2 scenario, an average increase of about 2.2 degrees Celsius and a decrease of 1.2% in average rainfall. In order to use these estimates, however, the outputs of these models had to be downscaled significantly, since at the scale of GCM outputs, the whole of South Africa falls within about 12 cells. To understand the climate change outputs, it is important to remember the factors that drive change in tree and grass production water balance, controlled by both rainfall and temperature, carbon dioxide, and temperature. The water balance and temperature factors drive production down in the future in this case, whilst carbon dioxide drives it up. It differs for trees and grass, but note that the climate factors overwhelm the CO2 effect. As you can see, the trends are similar, but the extent of change in drivers differs between the two scenarios. For the first scenario, the water balance drops and the increase in carbon dioxide will slowly increase the grass production and decrease tree production to a greater extent. The temperature increase will increase grass production and decrease tree production. The same drivers are true for the second scenario, but the extent of the drivers is much greater. Here are the runs without herbivores, carnivores and elephants. In the first low impact scenario, we see an increasing amount of grass primary productivity although the rate of increase tapers somewhat by 2080 in response to the decreasing rainfall. In the high impact scenario below, the grass primary productivity initially increases very rapidly, and after mid-century the rapidly decreasing water balance causes a drop in production, which by 2080 is likely to be less than current levels. In both scenarios the tree productivity drops. These effects carry through into the herbivores, but in neither case are they as dramatic as adding uncontrolled elephant populations, even in the absence of climate change. In the low-impact scenario, the responses are similar to those modelled at current levels, an initially rapid increase in browser population, peaking in 2020 and then steadily decreasing, and a gradually increasing grazer population throughout. However, in the high-impact scenario, there is considerable change. The browser population follows a similar trend, although the 2020 peak is lower than the low impact scenario, and the subsequent rate of population loss is greater. However, grazers do not steadily increase, but rather quickly reach a stable population, which begins to reduce as the amount of available grass decreases in response to the reduced rainfall. Clearly, the high impact scenario details significant impacts on savanna biodiversity, both in terms of animal and plant life. So, this simple model leads us to the hypothesis, it would need more detailed work to have a more firm conclusion, that contrary to current wisdom, rising carbon dioxide will not necessarily lead to trees taking over from grasses. Just the opposite happens, because the detrimental effects of drying and warming on trees are greater than the benefits of rising carbon dioxide. 
In terms of parks management, grazer and browser numbers could be impacted by climate change towards the second half of the century under high climate change scenarios, and this would in turn impact carnivores. Elephants are a major factor in the vegetation, and when at a high density, transform the landscape into a stable coppiced state, to the detriment of some other herbivores. Thus, the outcome of climate change-induced habitat transformation is to a large extent dependent primarily on management policies and impacts in the arena of fires and elephants. This means that managers should therefore concentrate efforts on these two areas, minimizing the required inputs.